Well, I never kind of thought about who I was going to be, uh, if I was going to be a leader or not. I did love foreign policy. I actually thought about being a journalist. But my story is one where it took me a very long time to um, find my voice. And now I say it took me a long time to find my voice, and I'm not going to be quiet. My fellow Americans, tonight I want to speak with you about the tragedy in Kosovo and why it matters to America that we work with our allies to end it. When I became United States Secretary of State in 1997, I knew that the Yugoslav province of Kosovo was a tinderbox. It had an ethnic Albanian majority, but was governed from Belgrade by the Serb-dominated regime of Slobodan Milosevic. In 1989, Serbia's leader, Slobodan Milosevic, the same leader who started the wars in Bosnia and Croatia, stripped Kosovo of the constitutional autonomy its people enjoyed, thus denying them their right to speak their language, run their schools, shape their daily lives. For years, Kosovars struggled peacefully to get their rights back. When President Milosevic sent his troops and police to crush them, the struggle grew violent. In 1998, violence erupted between the Kosovo Albanians, who were eager to assert their rights, and the Serbs, who saw the province as a key to their own identity and history. For months, we tried to negotiate a peaceful settlement. Progress at the Rambouillet talks is slow, far too slow. Uh, my meetings with Milosevic were quite stunning. He was trying very hard to be charming, and I was not about to be charmed. And I think that uh, he should understand that if airstrikes occur, uh, they will, uh, be, he will be hit hard and he will be deprived of the things that he values. I don't think they all, the autocrats, have the same characteristics, but they are people who um, are very sure of themselves, who are uh, bound and determined to gain power by separating people, by aligning with one group in order to create scapegoats out of the others. We did try an awful lot of diplomacy. There is an offer, again, of dialogue, which is something that we do want, because we believe that this can ultimately only be resolved uh, through a political solution. The Albanians said yes, but the Serbs said no, and began massing troops in preparation for an attack. As the Kosovars were saying yes to peace, Serbia stationed 40,000 troops in and around Kosovo in preparation for a major offensive. Their plan, according to information we had, was to kill or drive out the Albanian population through a campaign of ethnic cleansing and terror. We've seen innocent people taken from their homes, forced to kneel in the dirt and sprayed with bullets. Kosovar men dragged from their families, fathers and sons together, lined up and shot in cold blood. With Russia wielding a veto over any action by the United Nations, I argued that NATO should act. President Clinton pushed me and my colleagues on the Principles Committee for every scrap of information. Sitting at his desk, trying to ward off a headache by pressing a can of Diet Coke to his temple, he questioned everything, the history, personalities, social and cultural factors, risks to our troops, potential cost to civilians, and whether our post-conflict plans were realistic. People often wonder how decision-making takes place uh, in the White House and how the deliberations happen. A good national security advisor will kind of break the eggs uh, in order to get the different views, and then uh, on a less uh, difficult situation, 
create an omelet to give to the president. If you can't create the omelet, you give the egg mess to the president, and then you go in and discuss it in front of the president. And President Clinton, he wanted to know about all the options, um, and he pressed us. And frankly, he thought it was very useful for us to argue in front of him, and he was very respectful of our different views, and he clearly absorbed them, and that is what leadership is about. But now we knew what was going on in the Balkans, and I really thought that it was important for us to act because we did know, and there were no excuses. We had to do something to end ethnic cleansing. The Secretary of State can talk about the use of force, but has no airplanes or troops. And therefore, it meant that I had to persuade the Pentagon in order to be able to do anything. Uh, I'm there, uh, a mere mortal female civilian, arguing with the military. There is the assumption, uh, when you're sitting as the only woman with a group of men, that uh, women don't know how to lead. And what always does happen, or certainly happened when I was arguing that we needed to do something in Bosnia earlier, um, is don't be so emotional. That is the way that uh, you make clear that the woman's voice doesn't have the same weight. And I felt very strongly that in order to have a view that you had to know the facts. You had to know what you were talking about. You had to understand what the counter arguments were. Uh, but at the same time, it is uh, insufficient to say that dialogue could go forward. Um, if uh, the, uh, the killing of civilians and depopulating of villages um, will uh, continues. Ultimately, President Clinton agreed that military action was necessary. So did our allies. The night before hostilities began on March 23rd, the president called me the same time he usually did, around 1 a.m., because he never slept and didn't think anyone else needed to. He said, we're doing the right thing. I said, yes, Mr. President, we are. Today, our armed forces joined our NATO allies in airstrikes against Serbian forces responsible for the brutality in Kosovo. But it is incredibly hard to send American forces into harm's way. We knew it was necessary, but we could not know how it would turn out. As it happened, the early days were brutal. Milosevic's thugs swarmed into Kosovo and began burning villages and murdering civilians. For the first time since World War II, we saw horrible pictures of people in Europe being loaded into trains like cattle. The weather was bad, so many of our planes couldn't fly. And then on the morning of May 7, 1999, my executive assistant said, you better sit down. NATO has just mistakenly bombed the Chinese embassy in Belgrade. Through it all, the president was remarkably steady, and so was our team. We all worked feverishly to keep the alliance together. In time, the weather improved and our airstrikes became affected. Finally, Milosevic had no alternative but to yield. His troops departed and more than a million Kosovo refugees were able to return home. I was proud soon thereafter to visit the region and I spoke to a large crowd assembled in the capital city central square. Everywhere there were signs and banners. It was a time of great emotion, of grief and joy, anger and hope. The years of grinding repression and the horror of ethnic cleansing were over. The fighting had ended. Refugees were returning. The displaced were reclaiming their homes. At long last, Kosovo was free. Well, I, I do think that it's interesting to kind of think about 
once you've made a decision, should we have, could we have done it differently? Because there's been the question that we did it with NATO, an alliance, and not through the United Nations. Um, and there are some who believe that what we did was illegal because we didn't go through the United Nations. Um, they have not studied the issue because there was a Security Council resolution that said that what was going on in Kosovo was a threat to peace. But um, I knew, uh, as a result of talking to um, the Russian foreign minister, that they would have vetoed anything that we thought to do more through the United Nations. And so uh, I have argued that it was right to go with NATO uh, and that uh, it has been a success to the extent that ethnic cleansing has stopped. And women have to learn to interrupt. Often, if you're the only woman in the room, you think to yourself, I won't say that. Uh, and then some man says it, and everybody thinks it's brilliant. Um, I do think that as there are more women in the room uh, and have to take decisions and see themselves as partners, I do think and hope that women's voices are more respected. Kosovo today remains a place of testing for democracy but I'm proud of what we accomplished and grateful for the opportunity to have made a difference.